Good afternoon, everybody. Um, today, it is my pleasure to introduce our colloquium speaker, Professor Priya Natarajan from Departments of Astronomy and Physics at Yale University, where, where she's also director of the Franke program in science and the humanities. Priya got her BA degree at MIT in physics and astronomy and followed that with a master's degree in their science, technology and society program, which reflects some of her subsequent activities, going to get her PhD in astrophysics at the Institute for Astronomy in Cambridge under Isaac Newton Fellowship at the Trinity College, where Martin Rees was her advisor. She then spent a year at CETA as a postdoctoral fellow and joined Yale faculty in 2000. So Priya has worked on a large number of interesting subjects in astrophysics and cosmology, a lot of them having to do with gravitational lensing and its applications for things like cluster mass modeling, substructure, uh, cosmography, and as well as in black hole physics, uh, accretion, their growth, or formation of first seed black holes, intermediate mass black holes, the coevolution of black holes and, and their host galaxies, and other issues in galaxy formation, more recently also in the multi-messenger astrophysics and machine learning uh, in data-driven discovery. Priya is also a chair of the National Academy, I'm sorry, Astronomy and Astrophysics Advisory Committee as a leadership of the Black Hole Initiative at Harvard and associate with Flat, Flat Iron Institute in New York. She has, holds or has held a number of distinguished uh, honorary or visiting professorships, including the Sophie and Taco Brache professorship at the Dark Cosmology Center at the Niels Bohr Institute in Copenhagen, um, and a number of others. A lot of distinctions, too numerous to go through right now. She is the fellow of the American Physical Society, of the Royal Astronomical Society. She was a Guggenheim fellow. And she uh, wrote uh, an award-winning popular science book called Mapping the Heavens, which has been recognized with distinctions in numerous places. And something that caught my eye as I was learning more about her is that she co-authored with, with an artist a virtual reality experience, astronomy motivated one, which was also invited to be presented at the Venice Biennale. So without much further ado, I will just let Priya take it over and tell us about the, some of the exciting recent work that she's been doing. So Priya, all yours. Um, thank you so much, uh, George uh, and Jim for the invitation and George for that uh, particularly uh, kind introduction. As you all probably guessed, I'm just having a lot of fun learning, learning all kinds of things. So uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is a real privilege to uh, have this opportunity today to talk to you all about some recent results um, that we've had uh, from uh, cluster lensing and um, results that, as I will um, talk further, seem to have very intriguing um, implications for our current sort of understanding of uh, the cold dark matter uh, paradigm. So I also want to say hello to many friends who are in the audience and many mentors, um, including Richard Ellis, who has known me since I first started working uh, on lensing. And I also want to thank uh, collaborators on the work that I'll be talking about today. Um, uh, many collaborators, um, observers who have very kindly um, uh, provided, gone out, uh, taken data, very difficult, complicated data sets, and um, have uh, contributed to the analysis, and to simulation teams who also kindly shared uh, their data, simulated data for comparison. So um, as you all know, um, the composition of our cosmos is rather peculiar and that we have compelling evidence for the existence of vast amounts of non-baryonic dark matter. And we believe that this component is a cold collisionless uh, particulate dark matter likely formed in the very early universe. 
Um, till very recently, we were all fixated on one particular kind of particle, uh, weakly interacting uh, mass of particles. And we have recently um, extended our bandwidth to include sort of lighter class of particles, axioms, which are also permitted in the early universe. So in addition to this sort of missing component of dark matter, as you all know, um, another peculiar ingredient in our universe is dark energy, which is the dominant constituent, uh, which appears to be, once again, like dark matter, we know what it does, we don't know what it is. So dark energy, um, is powering the accelerating expansion of a universe and dark matter appears to be structuring most of the universe. So we've been very fortunate that despite not knowing the particle, the particulate nature of this, uh, of, uh, this of CDM, not really knowing either um, uh, its mass or uh, exactly when it is likely to have formed in the early universe, although we have epochs that uh, we know are uh, permit the formation of a particle with the right amount of observed uh, energy density today to account for the omega matter that we just saw in the pizza sliver. So um, another feature of the CDM paradigm is that despite that, we are able to actually make very detailed um, predictions on cosmic scales, um, astrophysics, astrophysical properties of an ensemble of these dark matter particles. And so in this uh, cosmological end body simulations have been incredibly powerful and useful tool. So I'm just showing you here a visualization of how you can start with a set of initial conditions with small fluctuations imprinted in the sea of dark matter, which then get amplified by gravity over time, and then eventually with baryons falling into the intersections of these filamentary deep potential wells created by dark matter, you end up cooling, forming stars. And I'm just gonna skip over all of this because you, know, you have experts like Phil Hopkins who has uh, probably indoctrinated you all already on the power um, and the beauty of uh, cosmological simulations. So the developments in cold dark matter theory essentially started from the late 70s and 80s. And what was observed, which was really remarkable, was um, the fact that detailed properties of visible matter and the relationship of mass and light was something that could be predicted by these simulations, modulo recipes for the formation of stars and feedback. Now the evidence for this collisionless dark matter component has, um, is, is available on a range of scales, starting from the distribution of the uh, temperature and isotropies in the relic radiation from when the universe was about 400,000 years old. So what I show here is uh, one of these maps from the WMAP satellite data to the existence of um, clusters of galaxies and estimates of their mass that also suggest that there is a vast component of invisible dark matter. And then there are cases, of course, the classic case that we all now attribute for the detection of the existence of dark matter arises, of course, on galactic scales from the work of Vera Rubin, Kent Ford and others in the 70s, where essentially to explain the motion of the stellar component in most galaxies, uh, you appear to require an extended dark matter halo. And the most recent um, intriguing um, evidence for the collisionless nature, and I want to stress this because often um, it's uh, misused that the bullet cluster tells you that there is dark matter. It actually tells you that you have a collisionless component of dark matter because you see the separation between the baryonic component shown here in the X-ray data with the bullet shape when two subclusters have merged to form this larger bullet cluster. And so the dark matter sits, as you can see in that blue haze. So we have from a range of scales, very strong evidence for the existence of, and we have now a detailed understanding of the spatial distribution of this collisionless dark matter component. 
And I just wanted to show this um, because I was quite intrigued when I was trying to, uh, to see, you know, how far back, after, how soon after the proposal of the cold dark matter model were people raising fundamental questions about it. And it turns out that, you know, this is a scorecard from 1990. And so some of the questions that I'm going to end with today are actually not new. They have been asked quite often, and not just because we've not yet found the particle, but even with the kind of statistical properties of structures that cold dark matter predicts and the observational data. So there have been many challenges to this cold dark matter uh, model, despite its incredible success, as I just showed you on a range of scales, there is independent evidence corroborating this idea of uh, cold dark matter. And there've been many challenges in terms of proposed modifications to the nature of dark matter. So there's warm, there, there've been warm dark matter models, self-interacting dark matter models, dissipative dark matter models, plasmon dark, I mean, the list goes on. There's some very, very interesting ones that um, I will slightly delve into later on, but most of my talk will be really focused on testing the cold dark matter uh, paradigm. As I just mentioned, CDM has been really, really successful. And not only do we have um, uh, strong supporting evidence from the uh, power spectrum uh, of the temperature fluctuation in the microwave background, but you also have now direct measurements from clustering and abundance and luminosity of galaxies uh, constraint on the linear matter power spectrum of cold dark matter. And so again, these are multiple independent observational probes across a range of scales. As you can see, this is um, on the right-hand side, the, the matter power spectrum as a function of wave number. And you know, it's really quite remarkable, the range of scales over which we have data. So all the data points there are from a range of probes, uh, cosmic microwave background, galaxies, Lyman alpha, uh, lensing, and so on. So one of the reasons for the, um, for the resilient nature of this model has been the testable, very um, testable predictions that this model makes. And the fact that this model actually permits us in very interesting and simple ways to connect mass and light and offers tests of uh, how ma mass and light are related to each other. So one of the key predictions of the model is <clears throat> it was found by Navarro, Frank, and White from cosmological simulations that the cold dark matter seems to settle down in equilibrium in virialized collapsed halos that separate out the, from the cosmological expansion into a universal density profile that has a very specific well-defined shape. And this is universal because it appears to hold over 20 orders of um, magnitude in terms of the masses of structures, collapsed masses of structures, they all seem to, uh, to be well described by this one single density profile that <clears throat> has a power law in the innermost regions and has a two changes of slope, r to the minus two and r to the minus three. And however, despite all the successes uh, of the model, there appear to be, as we obtained deeper data and um, many more observational probes, trouble seemed to appear on small scales. And so before I sh uh, talk a little bit about the kinds of troubles that emerge, let me quickly kind of flash that the nature of dark matter, although astrophysically, as I've reiterated a couple of times that we don't have access to the particle itself and its uh, properties, um, astrophysics still and cosmic observations on these scales actually do provide some hints strong hints on the nature of dark matter. One of them has to do with what is now called a substructure, which is the amount of small scale structure that is associated with larger scale collapse structures in the universe. So what you see here on the right-hand panel are two cos uh, cosmological simulation slices at the same time with two different initial conditions, one in which the dark matter is cold and the other one uh, in which the dark matter is warm. And they are the same structure seen because they're the same initial conditions just with a uh, different particle nature. And you can see clearly by eye that there is a lot of substructure crud, if you will, in cold dark matter compared to warm dark matter, which is very, very smooth. 
So at some level, if we are able to, this is of course a dark matter only simulation, but if there was a way in which we could simply just count the substructure, it's very clear just visually that there has to be a remarkable difference in the number of substructures that are predicted as a function of scale, especially on small scales. And so on the left-hand side, I show you these two predictions. And so if you go low down in mass, the contrast between cold dark matter and warm dark matter starts to emerge quite dramatically. But on fairly large scales, they look very, very similar. So we, one has to really push down to lower mass scales. So we've had a wave of crises in cold dark matter. <clears throat> and I'm going to focus on two that are most relevant to what I'm going to be talking about today. And those are the missing satellite problem and the cusp core problem. I mean, there have been other sort of uh, problems and challenges, and there have been some very nice reviews uh, that I can uh, suggest for you to get more details. And <clears throat> the, of course, you know, um, it is not lost on anyone that uh, we've had much discussion in cosmological circles that we may have some more fundamental issues too, uh, beyond just the cold uh, dark matter uh, with the standard cosmological model, as we've recently realized that the um, estimations of the Hubble expansion from the nearby universe and the distant universe are discrepant, are discrepant nearly at five sigma. Now this is, you know, has been touted as the new, uh, the latest crisis in cosmology, and you know, I, I, one can devote an entire talk. That's I am not going to be talking about that uh, today. So uh, coming on to the cusp core problem. So <clears throat> where this problem emerged and manifested was on small scales in the internal structure of uh, of halos. And so here, what you have uh, is the density profile of a low mass galaxy, a dwarfish galaxy, where in the dotted line, you see the prediction from the navarro frank white profile. And the data points show you that this profile actually appears to turn over and there appears to be a core rather than a power law cusp in these galaxies. And this is not just one individual galaxy, but it turns out that these are very small scales. So we're talking about sub, parsec, uh, sub kiloparsec, sorry, scales where the resolution of simulations is kind of limited. Um, and the centers of galaxies are actually sort of complicated by prescriptions used for feedback, star formation, black hole activity. And it turns out, you know, observations were also challenging, but we've been able to push down. And this really does appear to be a, a discrepancy. However, um, in order to explain this discrepancy, the flattening of this power law, um, cold dark matter cusp, it was argued that uh, potentially uh, there, are some, there are permitted sort of weak self interactions which kick in at, uh, at very, these very high densities in the inner parts of these halos. And so you start to flatten and form a core. So the nature and alternate nature for dark matter, the self-interacting dark matter model was proposed. However, it turns out that this tension resolved when baryonic processes were better modeled in simulations. So simulations were actually able to produce uh, cores. So by and large, um, I think in my opinion and in uh, the opinion of most cosmologists, the cusp core problem is largely solved. So that crisis in cosmology was averted. So I want to point out that that crisis had to do with the internal structure of halos, uh, the detailed internal structure. The, one of the other crises had to do with the abundance of subhalos. So this has to do with really the number. And once again, this was on uh, small scales and this was the mis so-called missing satellite problem. So once again, what you have here is cosmological simulations have a prediction, a cold dark matter has a prediction for the number of satellites that a halo, a, large, uh, a larger dark matter halo of a given mass, the number of lower mass satellites it should, um, it should contain. So here you see in the uh, dark uh, curve, the solid curve, those are the predictions from simulations. So simulations predict a very large number of subhalos. So in this case, uh, several hundred, say in the inner, uh, in, with these are as a function of circular velocity. So this is a, a, a proxy for the mass of the subhalo. And what you see in the data points uh, are significantly lower. So 
CDM predicts an overabundance of satellites that are not really observed. So I want you to keep in mind the, um, the direction in which these crises uh, appeared uh, when they appeared. Notice that in the inner structure, density structure of um, the cusp, uh, cusp core problem, cold dark matter predicts a steeper slope. And in reality, you see a flatter slope. And here, once again, cold dark matter predicts an overabundance of satellites and you see fewer satellites. And it turns out that this problem obviously was you know, for the local group, um, uh, the data are for the local group. And so um, you can imagine that once this abundance mismatch got resolved when fainter satellites were detected and when simulations, once again, the treatment of baryonic processes in simulations was improved. So once again, it would be fair to say there are no missing satellites because they were just fainter satellites that we have now found. So keeping this in mind, one of the key features of cold dark matter is that it is essentially self-similar on scales. So if indeed one of these problems was truly endemic to CDM, we should see this reflected on the next mass scale in the hierarchy, because it's a hierarchical model uh, in, uh, of structure formation in CDM. You should see this reflected in the next scale of the mass hierarchy. And the next scale, so we've been talking about galaxies and the next scale in the mass hierarchy are clusters of galaxies. And so um, much of my talk from now on is going to involve uh, studying the detailed structure of uh, cluster galaxies, galaxies that are members of these largest repositories of dark matter in the universe and how they match up with when you confront them with simulations of cold dark matter. And um, in particular, I will be focusing on the very powerful technique of gravitational lensing, which is going to allow us to map structure on small scales within clusters. Before that, for those of you um, who don't normally work on clusters, here's a, just a quick uh, primer of what really uh, clusters are about. By composition, only 1% of the mass is in uh, stars in the galaxies, so approximately 10% is in the X-ray emitting hot gas, and the rest is all dark matter. So these are, you know, perfectly, uh, this sort of the perfect dark matter um, astrophysical laborator laboratories, if you will. So obviously the big open questions in clusters have been, you know, how much mass is locked up in these clusters? D does light trace mass? And if so, how well? How is the dark matter distributed spatially? And in particular, how granular is the dark matter? So I'm just giving you a, you know, a set of, there's been a lot of work over the years. I've really sort of given you a set of references if you want to look further on people who've done a lot of work using gravitational lensing in particular and dynamics to answer some of these big questions. So I'm going to focus on uh, using gravitational clusters as gravitational lenses to map their uh, granular distribution. This is just a quick schematic to remind you all of one key feature of lensing is you have a distant population of sources. In this particular case, I'll be talking about distant galaxies. Of course, these sources could be quasars too. Um, and then you have a foreground mass distribution and you can measure the deflection in, um, in the light from these distant sources, the way it manifests, depending on the alignment between us, the lens and the source, the angular ratio of angular diameter distance ratios, you can see a range of effects. If the, there is perfect alignment versus uh, near perfect alignment versus not so perfect alignment. This deflection angle notably depends on the mass of the lens. In fact, it's not quite just the mass of the lens, it's all the mass that is within the cylinder between us and the lens. It turns out clusters being the most massive and rarest objects in the universe, the most recently um, formed objects in a cylinder that typically um, um, you know, is um, drawn from our eyes, from the earth, from telescopes out to distant sources, you are unlikely to expect more than one massive cluster along the line of sight. So it's really, strictly speaking, you're dominated by the mass of the cluster that you're talking about. And then you have a dependence of this deflection angle on uh, cosmological parameters, and because it comes up in, the, in terms of these geometrical distance ratio factors. 
So you can see that, you know, if you know the underlying cosmology, the world model, then from the measured deflections and the effects, as we'll see in a minute, um, you can actually map out the mass and vice versa, right? And if you know the mass incredibly well, you can put constraints on cosmology. And of course, the ideal thing is if the data is really good enough, you should be able to do both simultaneously. And that's been attempted, but that's not something I'm gonna be talking about uh, today. So the key thing is that the deflection is proportional uh, to the mass. And depending on the quality of the data, you can actually reconstruct the mass in the lens. And again, once again here, I don't, you know, I don't have to give you too much of an introduction because you've had uh, people like Richard around, uh, around who've been sort of pioneers in not just mapping uh, the structure of clusters, but also using and exploiting their uh, uh, magnification of, uh, effects to really peer into the even more distant and early universe and uncover the first galaxies. So what I'm showing you here is just a schematic of you know, what the light deflection actually ends up producing. It produces a plethora of effects. As I mentioned, if the alignment is perfect, then you can see what looks like a nearly circular object. You can see this in, uh, so this is a montage of cluster lenses, two cluster lenses, and a family of galaxy scale lenses because this uh, uh, intervening lens can be either a cluster or a galaxy. And so you see a range of distorted shapes of background galaxies that are magnified, multiply imaged, and so on. So what are we going to use these uh, nature's telescopes for? We're gonna actually use them to map substructure. And there is a concrete prediction from CDM. This is just the slice that I showed you earlier on, that the number of subhalos as a function of mass is actually predicted to be a power law in mass and m to the minus 1.8. So as I mentioned earlier, if there was a way in which we could access and map this clump distribution as a function of mass, we have a very strong test of CDM. And this is something that uh, it turns out um, is strongly dependent of the nature of dark matter, so might allow us to constrain the nature of dark matter. So let me now uh, briefly describe how outline how this is done. And this is done by combining these effects of strong and weak gravitational lensing uh, to reconstruct the detailed spatial distribution of dark matter in these cluster, within these clusters. So you use the phenomena that you see in the strong lensing regime. This is the regime where you have perfect alignment, you have multiple images, highly distorted magnified arcs, which you can even see by eye in all these Hubble Space Telescope images. And so the quantity that we are really after is the projected surface mass density within the beam and the mass enclosed within the arc when you are perfectly lined up and that's the Einstein radius and that mass enclosed, the 2D mass enclosed within that arc is very tightly constrained. So that's what allows you to calibrate your mass maps. Of course, Knowing the redshifts of background sources is critical to calibrate the overall mass. And in all the data that I'm going to be showing you, we have exquisite amount of data in each cluster field. So we have the redshifts of the background sources. We have established cluster membership for these galaxies, the fuzzy yellow cluster member galaxies that you see in this picture of Abel 1689. Uh, and then you have, as you go further out away from the center where the dark matter density is actually quite peaked, you see weak lensing. So percent order of a percent, 2% coherent distortion in the shapes of background galaxies. And so that sort of shearing is then use, uh, used to construct these mass maps. And so the, the technique to really exploit um, weak lensing and to, to provide like mass distributions out to large radii was, uh, came from a very nice algorithm that was provided, uh, was actually um, devised by Kaiser and Squires. And Smale and Ellis were reproduced, used the Kaiser Squires algorithm and produced the sort of first cluster mass maps. So the new way to weigh clusters using gravitational lensing effort, um, effects, because previously a lot of the cluster mass determinations were done dynamically by looking at the motions of galaxies, you know, assuming equilibrium and so on. So this was a completely independent geometric way. And one of the nice things about lensing is that other than being achromatic, you see it in all wavelengths, it's also completely independent of the dynamical state of the cluster. So you can have a cluster that is out of equilibrium, like those 
to subclusters merging in the bullet cluster, and you could still measure the mass reliably. So I want to quickly go through this just to give you a sense of the strong lensing effects that I will be using in the mass reconstruction. Um, and I just want to stress what I'm showing you here are uh, the image plane, what we see as in terms of the distorted images that I just showed you in the Hubble Space Telescope um, images, and the source plane where you have the in, you know, in the frame of the distant source, often at redshifts greater than 1, 1 1.5, and so on. So what you see are these regions that you can match the critical curves for any given gravitational potential given its symmetries. So here I have plotted an elliptical mass profile. So you have an elongated mass that has you know, sort of an ellipsoidal shape. And we're looking at the lensing properties of that as a function of the source position. So there is a region in because of the projected mass within the cylinder, there's a region that diamond caustic, that region, where the relative position of the source relative to that caustic, that caustic structure is determined by the mass, um, mass profile and details of the mass distribution of the lens. And so as a function of the source position, you see a variety of strong lensing effects. So if you're really lined up, you see these multiple four, um, four magnified images and one demagnified image <clears throat> and so on. So you can see this range of geometries. In the work that I'm gonna show you, we reconstruct the masses of clusters exploiting data in multiple regimes. So the uh, a fully non-linear regime where basically you can think of this multiple uh, image mapping. You can think of it as a one-to-many mapping, like mathematically the image to uh, image plane to source plane. So that's a very highly non-linear regime. Then we have a quasi-linear regime where you see sort of slight distortion shapes. And then the weak regime where you see very systematic, really tiny distortions in shapes. So the mass profiles that I will be showing you have been reconstructed, exploiting all data from all those regimes. And so key to that has been understanding how to map the mass. What is the prior that you use to start mapping um, uh, the mass distribution? And so this is sort of work that I did you know, early in my PhD, where basically it was clear that if you want to compare what we derive from observational data with uh, simulations of CDM to really uh, to perform cosmological tests of the kind that I'm going to show you, then you need to have this kind of partition where you divide, the, um, divide up the projected 2D mass of the cluster into large scale smoother components and smaller scale perturbers. The reason the motivation for doing this is then one can associate modulo relationship between mass and light, the locations of the cluster galaxies as the locations of perturbers, i.e. we assume that the cluster galaxies contain their own individual dark matter halos that have survived their passage into the cluster. So if you partition the mass this way, use the observed um, uh, strong and weak lensing data in conjunction, and you map out the caustic. I showed you the caustic was nice little diamond in that theoretical case. And in this case of ABAL 2218, you'll see that it looks like a little bunny rabbit shown in yellow. So any source in the source plane that falls behind this region, that's the bunny rabbit, gets multiply imaged. So anyway, what can we do? What can we do with these mass maps? So on the right-hand side, you now see a reconstruction of the mass of the same cluster, ABAL 2218. And you see the sort of large scale smooth mass distribution. And what you see on small scales are these sub halos. So you can see where I'm going with this. Um, but before I show you the counting sub halos, which is now possible, I just want to make clear that we've made some assumptions about how you relate mass to light, especially for these sub halos, because I am associating them with the positions of uh, cluster galaxies. And I just want to tell you that um, that is very well tested now with data, with simulations, and the fact that mass and light are associated and they are associated in very empirically determined ways like the Faber-Jackson relation, are what are used in this modeling in these sort of scaling between light and mass. So you can start then now directly comparing the abundance of substructure, the subhalo mass function. You know, we did it way back when with Volker Springle with the Millennium Simulation in 2005. 
And so at that time, we had good mass distributions for you know, the clump subhalo mass distributions shown in the red histograms for about five clusters. Notice that it is miraculous that they fit on the same scale because the y-axis is actually number count, just the number of subhalos. And we just found mass matched samples in the Millennium box. So we just found a mass matched sample for 2218. And that's what you see in the black that is from uh, the Millennium box. And of course, you find a large number of clusters in that mass range, and that's the dispersion that you see in gray. So it's really not, you know, it's really quite good agreement. You don't see any remarkable disagreements. And, you know, I just want to point out that the mass limit, the cutoff that you see in the red histogram, that is really a limitation, observational limitation, limitation of the lowest mass subhalo that you can statistically obtain, obtain a constraint on. Uh, in the mass modeling. Notice OO24 sticks out and and this is a cluster in which you have two subclusters that are merging for which we could not find an analog in the Millennium box. We couldn't find a dynamical analog to that. So how do we improve on this? How do we push on this? So of course we had to wait for data to get much, much better. So using data from the CLASH program and the HST Frontier fields, which you know, uh, combining these two data sets and reconstructing the mass distribution has allowed us to, it's been a game changer. And of course, in the meanwhile, as we were waiting for the data to get better, the simulations also got significantly better. And so this is, again, a comparison with the illustrious suite. As I want to show here, here's the comparison of the reconstructed mass now shown in red uh, for a cluster, uh, ABAL 2744. It's a Hubble Frontier Fields cluster with uh, the illustrious uh, simulation box. And that is, uh, once again, the simulations are shown in the black histogram. So it's very intriguing. Again, the match, uh, notice that the y-axis is still, you know, it is left free. So it, I found it quite miraculous. I have to say that the number of subhalos, they actually fall on the same plot and uh, that they agree incredibly well. However, you may notice, although I have not shown you the full error bars in the observationally determined uh, uh, subhalo mass function, notice that there uh, is something intriguing that appears at like 10 to the 11 solar masses or so. It's gonna be relevant a little bit later. So 27, I just wanna show off a little bit. So this is um, you know, one of the highest resolution dark matter maps of a cluster that's ever been produced. It was produced by our group. Um, or oh, this is for 2744. You can see by eye the large number of subhalos that you can see as little peaks. So you can see a lot of the lenses that are embedded within your know, small scale lenses that are embedded within these large scale, uh, with this large scale cluster lens. However, we can we could do a lot more in terms of interrogating the CDM model here. And so we started looking at the radial distribution of subhalos for these mass matched uh, simulated clusters. And here we saw some first signs of tension between cluster lenses, um, uh, ob observed cluster lenses, reconstructions, uh, and uh, cold dark matter simulation. So I wanted to focus again on the red histogram. This is ABEL 22744. Notice that the subhalos in the real universe, in the real cluster, are concentrated towards the center. This is a plot of number as a function of projected radius. And notice the simulations are all the gray and the black. Um, and the cyan uh, 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 histograms. There's a real discrepancy. There's a real deficit of halos in the inner region. So you know, we thought that was very intriguing and that uh, needs to be followed up. And so what we did was follow up with spectroscopic data from MUSE on VLT to tighten the lensing mass models. We said, let's go and get redshifts for as many background sources as possible, build the best possible mass models that we can. And then we said, let's start looking because the data is now so good that we are able to detect these lenses, uh, small scale lenses that are embedded within the large scale lens. So each little subhalo, many of these little subhalos actually are critical. They are, uh, you know, they have Einstein radii. They have the capacity to produce their own strong lensing images. So uh, then we then we realized that there was a very interesting new metric that we could come up with that were offered a real uh, stringent test of the internal structure of these subhalos. And that is the galaxy galaxy strong lensing cross section. So it is the lensing efficiency of these individual lenses that are embedded within the large scale cluster lens 
their capacity to produce strong lensing uh, images. And of course, why did we come up with this metric? Because as it turns out, the data was so good that we started seeing these strong lensing features, which I'm not sure Zoom probably allows you to see very well. But you know, I have all these little uh, thumbnails that show you these um, strong lensing features that are actually produced by clustered galaxies. So around the sub halos, you see a lot of strong lensing features. So what they do produce, if you remember from my little lensing primer, is that these sub halos produce their own little diamond caustics, okay? And so we came up with this um, metric, the probability of galaxy-galaxy lensing, which is really just a sum of the areas in these caustics in the source plane. And uh, then we can actually, from this efficiency, this probability, we can actually compute the number of galaxy-galaxy strong lensing events, right? And so, um, what you need to do is you need to identify the secondary critical lines and then map these critical lines back into the source plane into caustics with a really well constrained uh, map, um, a dark matter mass model for the cluster. We are measuring the area enclosed by these caustics and then we obtain this cross section by summing up the areas. So now I just want to show you how this has been done. So here is the cluster M1206. The top uh, panel is a real cluster. We have a really um, very, very good lensing model where the prior, so, you know, as I mentioned, the MUSE data, one thing you get in MUSE, it's a multi-object spectra, it's spectacular. It's like an incredible instrument, right? So you get uh, spectra for everything in the field. So we are able to measure the velocity dispersions, the central velocity dispersions of clustered galaxies. And they were now used as a prior in the lensing model. Okay, so that removed much of the dependence that we had on the assumed scaling relations that you saw earlier, right? So now you go into a simulation, into a cosmological simulation, and then you identify a cluster, a mass matched cluster that produces a similar Einstein radius from the large scale distribution of dark matter. Then you can go ahead and say, okay, I have now found a lens, an equivalent to the lensing power of the overall lens. And now I can drill down into both the simulation and the mass model and compare the small scale lenses and their lensing power. So you can go and then look at all the caustics, the uh, reproduce the caustics, sum up the caustic areas. You can already see by eye, there's a real problem here. You see a lot of red little caustics, the secondary caustics are showing up for the real mass model for this cluster in the universe. And the simulated mass matched model has very few caustics of the same size. And just by eye, you can see they are much smaller number uh, and much smaller sizes of the secondary caustics. Okay, so, uh, so that was not just for one cluster. So a couple of years ago, we published this paper in science where we had 11 clusters from these two uh, surveys. We compared that with simulated clusters. And here is a galaxy galaxy um, uh, lensing probability as a function of source redshifts. As I showed you earlier, remember there's the source redshift matter. So this is a function of source redshift. And in orange, you see the prediction from cosmological simulation. So it's discrepant by an order of magnitude. And remember this metric is very sensitive. The galaxy galaxy strong lensing uh, cross section, which is really that the secondary caustic area is very sensitive to mass and closed on very small scales, very small apertures, you know, a couple of arc seconds. So, which is roughly five to 10 kiloparsecs. Okay? So what are we finding? What does this mean? It means that the inner regions of clustered galaxies in the real universe are, uh, are much more concentrated and are hence much more efficient strong lenses than uh, CDM uh, simulations predict. You might say, well, you know, how, how reliable have you, sorry, uh, have you done all these tests? So I will, you know, I just mentioned that, you know, we did all these sort of obvious tests, you know, are these, are these representative of clusters? Are these cluster lenses we've studied? Are they somehow all freaks? Um, and so we've tested for that, um, uh, or do they have any particular, um, are they biased in terms of their shapes, uh, um, et cetera? So I, you know, you can uh, you can go take a look at the paper. We did an exhaustive set of tests, including resolution, and so we the simulation resolution, right? So when we changed the resolution of the simulation by a factor of ten, we really did not find any difference. Really, the only thing that seemed to make a difference, and that you see in this top panel, is that if 
there was absolutely no AGN feedback in these simulations, which means that you have other problems. So AGN feedback was really introduced to resolve this overcooling problem in which basically uh, gas uh, falls into the centers of uh, halos and subhalos and too efficiently form stars that are not seen in the universe, right? So um, you overproduce stars because you are not able to stop the coolings. To halt the key, uh, cooling, you needed sources of energy injection and AGN feedback along with supernovae for which is more important for lower mass galaxies and for the kind of galaxies I'm talking about here, AGN feedback was invoked. So you can see that if you don't have any feedback at all, then you can kind of reproduce the observed GGSL. So clearly the AGN feedback as it is being implemented is rearranging the mass in the inner regions of subhalos. And, um, and they don't match the real universe. So you, know, you can ask you know, possible reconciliations and how could you resolve this order of magnitude discrepancy? You can ask, you know, is it just the accuracy of the lens models? You, know, or, you, know, you can look at um, whether there are systematics. And these have all been studied for a very long time because this lens mass modeling, cluster lens mass modeling is not new. And you know, our understanding of the errors, um, we have a very good understanding of the errors, both the systematic errors uh, um, and, the, and the random errors. And so can this, and then you can ask in the simulations, right, is the problem that is a some, you know, simple numerical artifact, like just numerical simulation, I'll show you again in continuing work, we are able to show that is not the case. Or is it artificial disruption of subhalos are somehow, um, and, you know, this, uh, this has been suggested, and it turns out that this is only, this can resolve and account for about a factor of two at most. We are talking about an order of magnitude gap. And then are there selection effects and maybe the simulations are not comparable to observed clusters and I just shown you we've already tested for that. And so you know we um, we are of course still continuing to do detailed comparisons. So you know other simulations seem to have the same problem not just the ones that we happen to use for comparison. So it turns out that most simulations most if not all simulations at the moment cannot match the observed properties of cluster galaxies. Okay, the point with simulations is that, you know, you have to simultaneously match many observed properties, right? So it turns out that a given mass observed subhalos are much more compact than their simulated counterparts. And, um, and that is really what is driving this discrepancy. And so the question is, you know, can a different implementation of star formation model itself and feedback model resolve the problem? The range of possibilities that people are exploring at the moment is really not enough. So there was a premature claim from people uh, uh, running the hydrangea simulations that, oh, we've resolved this discrepancy. And um, it turns out that um, the cluster galaxies that they produce in the cluster that they claim that they can match the galaxy galaxy strong lensing cross section, actually those cluster galaxies have way too many baryons. The stellar masses are highly discrepant with what is observed. And the caustic sizes that are needed to contribute. So as I told you, the primary contribution to the galaxy galaxy strong lensing, the secondary caustics, right? There's a very characteristic scale that of about two arc seconds, the Einstein radii of those subhalos that are contributing to this cross section are approximately two to three arc seconds. So, you know, you can, of course, if you have a group of galaxies uh, that has a very large diamond caustic as shown here from the hydrangea simulation, sure, you can account for the galaxy galaxy cross section, but, you know, you have to compare apples to apples, right? We are, uh, we are doing a census. We did a cut, but that is um, due to the data, uh, you know, completely determined by the resolution of the Hubble data and how far we can go in terms of uh, constraining uh, the mass model, what is our resolution of the lensing mass model that is determined by the sizes of uh, strong lensing images that we can actually uh, discern and resolve. So in our models, the largest lens models for observed clusters, the largest contribution to the cross section comes from subhalos with masses that are approximately um, 10 to the 11 solar masses. So um, this is just um, showing you again that the, the sub uh, secondary caustics are shown here in yellow, and that is sort of what we are adding. And one can argue that you have to be very, very careful about the region within which you are doing this counting. 
right? And so we have very well-defined cuts and, um, and we urge anyone else who is doing simulations to actually uh, make the same cuts uh, and compare with, with our observations. So here is a clear demonstration of what I've just been saying, right? So if you look at uh, the cluster max J1, um, uh, J1206, so here are um, here is the distribution of in blue, you see the distribution of um, the subhalos that are contributing the GGSL cross section as a function of Einstein radius. So the contribution in the lens models from the real universe is the blue histogram and the contribution from the hydrangea case, which I uh, mentioned was prematurely argued by Robertson and Bahe that they've resolved this problem. This is the distribution of Einstein radii. Notice that they do not match what is seen, right? So they are actually including this big group that makes the bulk of the contribution to the galaxy galaxy strong lensing uh, cross section. This is just to show you another view. So the simulation. So this is where we are with our follow up work, and the, and this discrepancy persists. So what you see in the black histogram is the from the observational data set from our models the distribution of the Einstein radii of the sources, the subhalos that contribute to the galaxy galaxy um, uh, uh, strong lensing cross section. And what you see in dashed are the simulations. And these are simulations with varying resolution. So we're just in the progress of writing this up and showing that you know, the resolution, just saying, uh, you know, just improving the resolution of the simulation is not going to solve this order of magnitude um, discrepancy. Remember, I've made the case that you know, if a problem is endemic in CDM, then it should start getting reflected uh, on lower scales. So the, you may ask, is there a similar problem? So here we are finding uh, a problem in a cluster environment that went in the opposite direction to the cusp core problem. And we do not have an abundance problem. We don't have a missing satellite problem on cluster scales, right? So you can ask whether this problem is replicated on smaller scales. And what you can do is you can do, uh, you can do a comparison of the sizes, the effective uh, radii of say SLACS lenses. These are individual galaxies acting as lenses. Um, it's a lot of work has been done by Tomas Latreo and his group on this. So if you use that data and compare that with simulations, you once again find that the um, simulations cannot really reproduce mass matched cannot really reproduce uh, the distributions, the effective radii observed for individual lenses. And so there's been very nice work that's going on on galaxy galaxy lenses um, on um, isolated galaxy galaxy lenses, which are not in the cluster environment. I just wanted to give a shout out to the various groups around the world that are doing very, very nice work um, trying to constrain the uh, subhalo mass function, the amount of substructure, and tie that to the expectations and predictions from various uh, dark matter models. Okay, so where does that leave us? So we have only two possibilities left. So we either have some poor understanding of the interplay between dark matter and baryons in cluster cores that goes in the opposite direction to what was found uh, earlier in the cusp core problem on small scales, which remember eventually went away. Um, or there are some deeper problems with the CDM paradigm. So, you know, it's something we are missing in the simulations in putting in the interplay between dark matter and baryons in the inner regions in very dense environments. Maybe we are missing something, or maybe there's something about the CDM paradigm itself, you know, the collision less assumed collision less nature of dark matter that maybe. And so these kinds of gaps are very, very important because, you know, if you interrogate what is a standard paradigm, then, and you find a gap, then it can either portend refinements or revisions, or it can actually point the way to something really radical, uh, radically revisionist. You know, this is the case for those of you who are history, uh, history of astronomy buffs, this is very much like the case for the Uranus, uh, the case of uh, the discovery of Uranus and Neptune, where there was just, you know, um, Newton's laws were intact and you just found Neptune, which perturbed and the mismatch with Newton's predictions was uh, explained away with the finding 
uh, with the prediction and finding of Neptune, whereas when the same argument was applied for the precision uh, precession of the perihelion of Mercury and the uh, potential existence of an inner planet called Vulcan was proposed, remember there is no Vulcan, right? And that uh, precession needed um, a complete reformulation of gravity of Einstein's uh, GR to explain. So you never know when you find a gap, which for me, that's what is exciting. You don't know which of these two cases uh, we have really encountered. And of course, the data from upcoming space missions, um, you know, all these observatories and missions will really help us. Meanwhile, um, recently figured out that, you know, people have often uh, you know, criticized me for, you know, working on these two big different problems, you know, I should focus and work on one problem, instead of, you know, just focus on black holes or just focus on dark matter. It turns out that I'm able to perfectly marry these two uh, interests, these deep interests, um, into this one very intriguing and surprising uh, alternative dark matter. As I said, right, there are all these uh, warm, self-interacting, double disk, dissipative dark matter that have been proposed. So most recently, we explored this very intriguing model of primordial black holes as dark matter. So this has come into vogue. It was originally proposed by Hawking and Carr, but it has come back into vogue when uh, Simeon Bird, uh, Kamiankovsky, and others tried to explain the 30 solar mass LIGO black holes, stellar mass black holes, as potentially as a primordial population, all uh, you know, at 30 solar masses. There have been much more refinements in that picture and understanding. So there was a recent prediction of a potential birth mass function for these primordial black holes. And it turns out that if you um, these features are produced by you know phase transitions in the early universe and they have characteristic masses, it turns out that in red you see the primordial ma uh, black hole mass function peaked at about one solar masses. So this is the fraction of uh, primordial black holes that contribute to dark matter as a function of black hole mass. So we explored this scenario. And so if all of dark matter is made of primordial black holes of various sizes, so here's a little visualization of what a halo might look like. So if you want to look at details, you may, um, I, I will point you to this paper, a recent paper with Nico Capelluti and Gunther Asinger. So an intriguing thing that we found was that, you know, Gunther and Nico were really interested in using uh, this model to really explain a long uh, standing conundrum of an observed excess in the cross correlation of the x ray background and the infrared background on sort of arc minute scale. So there's an excess that we've really not been, had not been able to uh, excess power that one couldn't explain. Uh, with uh, any, uh, you know, any set of population, you know, high redshift, low redshift, just couldn't really explain. But it suggests that there is accretion power hiding somewhere in the universe, tucked away. Um, and to give you this precise signature, we found that these PBH um, uh, dark matter halos uh, this model actually is able to fit that conundrum, but then it makes some interesting predictions. And the predictions is that in such a model, you basically form galaxies much earlier because, you, and you form accreting black holes much earlier because they formed primordially and they condense into halos much earlier than in CDM. So you have a larger number of sources. So if JWST looks and just does, um, you know, number of sources as a function of magnitude, you really should start seeing a much larger number of sources. So this slope in just the number counts as a function of magnitude will be uh, you know, a, a sort of a strong test of this model. And in about two years, you should be able to get down to uh, those number counts. And you know, I'm very, very excited that you know, this model can actually be uh, uh, ruled out. So uh, let me just stop here and um, you know, stop with the aspiration, right? Which we all want is uh, Fixion. We want this new particle <laughs> that explains everything. And this is an XKCD cartoon that I like. And I've just added the GGSL excess here. So let me just stop here. Thank you so much for uh, listening. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Priya. This was wonderful. So we invite questions. Kindly raise your hand under the reactions in the bottom of your screen. Okay, Ranga, please. So I thought the uh, 
number one argument against having one solar mass black holes, primordial black holes being responsible for the dark matter as you would have seen many more events with macho and that placed pretty strong constraints yeah, yeah. on how many such black holes there are and therefore they, they couldn't account for all the dark matter. Then there was the other point which, so that's for one solar mass black holes, but there's also the consideration that if you have lower mass black holes, you know, a few times um, 10, 24 grams or so, um, those would produce Hawking radiation and should contribute to the gamma ray background. And we don't see that strong an isotropy in the gamma ray background. So those were the two arguments against having really low mass black holes or even one solar mass black holes. Any thoughts yeah. on that? Yeah, so it turns out that the spectrum that I showed you, right, is consistent. Those bounds are not as stringent and they are not as strong. And that the model that I showed you actually is consistent with those, it turns out. I'm surprised by that, but okay. Yeah. And, and I think that the, um, uh, yeah, I should just point out that the, you know, all primordial black holes being 30 solar masses, that cannot contribute more than 0.1% or so of the dark matter, uh, it turns out. Yeah, so that sort of a, a monochromatic mass uh, range model is ruled out, but it turns out it's the shape of this spectrum, which is consistent uh, within the constraints that we have. So, you know, the, the spectrum that I showed you is consistent with, with the ogle lenses, so ma um, the macho constraints and some individual ogle lenses uh, as well, and um, and the anisotropy uh, in the gamma ray background, you actually find that this is permitted and that actually works out. I was also very surprised, I have to say. And I think you're right that we have, you know, uh, we have wiggle room now because the constraints are, you know, uh, there are still windows that are open, right? So uh, the hundred solar mass window is open um, as well. Thank you. Yeah. Well, something that I found very intriguing in our earlier discussion is the connection to intermediate mass black holes. Uh, seeds for, especially for supermassive black holes of high redshift, if you can just say a few more words about that. Yeah, so I think one of the intriguing things about the, uh, uh, this, uh, this PBH dark matter uh, model is that you also have a very natural way to make black holes of multiple, uh, on multiple mass scales. Um, and, you know, Throughout uh, um, uh, throughout cosmic time, so it turns out that you will fill in the intermediate mass uh, black hole mass range with PBHs with just accretion uh, in the early universe. Of course, we are making some assumptions about the accretion when I sort of uh, I say that well, you know, you can make all these math. You are again assuming these sort of you know, bondy, uh, uh, bondy uh, accretion sort of, you know, so these are toy models, but um, just in terms of uh, filling in the uh, uh, mass function of seed black holes, this is another way of uh, producing um, sort of the more massive uh, seeds that are inter in the intermediate mass range. But, you know, as you know, there are, uh, we now, you know, uh, many of us have been exploring multiple other ways, even within the standard cold dark matter model uh, to make uh, uh, intermediate mass black holes. For example, nuclear star clusters, you know, treating nuclear star clusters as cocoons in which you could uh, early gas rich nuclear star clusters, even uh, late uh, in nuclear star clusters at late time. So throughout cosmic time, they could save a, serve as incubators where basically you have um, you know, wind fed accretion of a wandering random walking uh, black hole remnant that gathers mass and eventually settles to the center depending on the amount of gas you have, you could truncate that process and produce black holes of different masses, you know, 100 solar masses, 1,000, 10,000, uh, and so on. So I think that, you know, ma intermediate mass black holes have been elusive for two reasons. I think observationally, we've been looking at the wrong places for them. And, and I think the off-center, you know, uh, Da Cheng Ling's sort of uh, X-ray observed off-center off um, 
intermediate mass bl a black hole is one such case. And I think it turns out that when we look at all the accretion uh, models and you do this growth history over cosmic time, you find that that mass range is actually fairly short lived, uh, so to speak, because it corresponds to the uh, epochs characteristic epochs in the universe that are still gas rich where you can accrete and grow fairly. So you grow out of the IMBH uh, mass range fairly swiftly. You don't linger around in that mass range and you really grow swiftly. I mean, those two things I think um, can kind of explain. I think for me, what is intriguing with the PBH model and so on is that, you know, regardless, right, in any universe, PBH universe or CDM universe, there just seem to be many, many more, there seem to be black holes everywhere. I mean, there seem to be many, many more black holes than we um, originally believed we had a census of. Great. Um, any more questions for Priya or comments? Gosh, have I stunned everybody into silence? Can I ask one more? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I didn't mean to hog the uh, hog the question. Not at all. I seem to have stunned everybody into silence. So much appreciated. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, regarding the uh, how to get more black holes, I mean, the easier way is to just change the IMF. Uh, I mean, that's yeah, sure, absolutely. It's trivial. You 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 get more black holes than you know what to do with if you change the IMF as a function of metallicity. Um, so I don't think. That's you the mean, argument. You mean in the early universe, right? Yeah, so you make it more top yeah, heavy yeah, yeah. and put it as, you know, low metal city galaxies have top heavy IMFs and you get way more 10 to 50 solar mass black holes. Yeah, so I, I'm not sure that's the argument for having primordial black holes. What do you mean that, uh, that you mean but just that- To, to get more of these tens of solar mass black holes. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, no well, fair point, fair point. It's just that I think we may, I mean, we may, that, I mean, we'll wait to see, right, with more LIGO events. I think we may run into some intriguing, um, um, you know, we might actually find an overabundance, right, um, uh, compared to what all the models are predicting. We need, we need to wait for one more run or so and see. The other interesting thing you said was, I mean, if you had no AGN feedback, you were able to get much better matches with the subhalo population. But how about if the AGN feedback were more directional, right? It doesn't have to be in four pi steradian. If all the AGN feedback was much more strongly beamed in say collimated jets or whatever, then would that help you um, match Likely. things much better? Yeah, th that's a good question. You know, I, and if Phil is here, I would be happy to hear um, uh, what he has to say about how it's actually implemented. It's implemented in different ways um, uh, in um, uh, uh, different simulation suites. But I think you're right that it's isotropic and clearly what the AGN feedback is doing is rearranging and moving baryons out, moving many more baryons out of the inner region somehow, because these AGN feedbacks now have these very large range outflows, a large scale outflows in these simulations and um, uh, quite possibly collimating them somehow um, might help uh, in alleviating, but I think essentially there's something not quite right, I think, with the energetics and the efficiency um, of uh, AGN feedback as uh, as it's implemented. So I don't know, Phil, uh, did you want to say something about whether uh, sort of a more yeah. beamed? Um, yeah, it's. I, I, we were just talking about this earlier, um, yeah. about this this sort of, not the beaming specifically, but this general question. I think there's, you know, as, as Priya was saying, there's, I think a lot of hints, you know, this is more indirect, but but also just from the gas properties in groups and clusters that a lot of the implementations of AGN feedback are, are acting too violently on the intra-cluster medium. Uh, you know, the simplest way to quench is to just violently eject everything, right? And uh, it gets you nice red galaxies uh, and quenching, but it, it's not what nature seems to do. So I agree that there's something, and most of the models lean towards that. You know, uh, you know, we're exploring some things ourselves, other groups are. I don't think that somebody's got a model that looks perfect compared to those observations, let alone these yet. Um, uh, so maybe, Beaming has, you know, jets and directionality could have something to do with it. And there are groups looking at that, but uh, I don't know if that's the whole story or if it's also other physics 
you know, nobody's really self-consistently modeling the relativistic particles, the radiation, all of this alongside the just outflows and things like that. So, yeah. Right. I mean, you, as you mentioned, Phil, you're yourself looking a little bit more into cosmic ray feedback, right? The models that are out there implementing those. Yeah. So we'll let you know if it looks intriguing. There. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Well, um, if there are no more questions, which we should thank Priya again and let her go to her well-deserved dinner. Uh, East Coast. I will also point out that she has kindly agreed to come and visit us in person once the whole pandemic stick dies down a little bit, yeah. hopefully later this year. And uh, we'll have plenty of opportunity to talk to her in person then. Yeah. So, thank you, so thank, thank you, thank you, Priya, and thank you all for coming. Yeah, thank you everyone for um, uh, meeting up and chatting one on one as well. It was really good fun. All right. Yeah. Good night. Yeah. Bye. Thanks, Priya. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Bye.